Welcome back to Press Here. I assume you're familiar with TED Talks. They're easily available online. They have all kinds of subjects. Now, what's cool about TED Talks is they're free, even though a ticket to the actual talk to be in the audience is $6,000 and you have to be invited. TED is at the same time both the most elitist and the most accessible event of its kind. To be a TED speaker, you have to be at the top of your field, one in a million. But then TED invented TEDx, where anybody can be a speaker talking about anything they wish. My next guest loves that idea of giving it away. Carl Ron has a theory that he calls the reciprocity advantage, which says somewhat counterintuitively by sharing your most car closely guarded secrets, you can grow your own business. He's authored a book by the same name along with co-author Bob Johansson. Carl is a former executive with Procter & Gamble. He is the man behind, are you ready for this, Swiffer and Febreze. That's kind of cool. <laughs> Thank you for being with us this morning. So how is this different, this idea that I am going to put my technology out there and let other people adapt it and use it? How is that different than open source, which has been around for quite some time? You know, so open source and um, open innovation is a very important piece of trying to optimize your current business and get the cost structure and get the growth. One of the things that's happening is, is we're now in a very social world and partnerships are extremely valuable to creating additional growth. The partnerships where you can reduce cost or make your current business better are very, very common. What there's an opportunity to do now, and TEDx is an example of, is partnering with the world right. to create something new while maintaining that current business. And so TED is just as strong or stronger, and TEDx is completely incremental it's, growth. It's almost as if you know you're on to something if your board says, oh no, don't do that, that would give away the secrets. It, that, then you know you have something valuable. Yes. What I think is even a better thing that happens is quite often somebody knocks on your door and says, can I have this? And then you get to say yes or no. You say no if what they're going to do is basically just eat you. Right. Okay. you know, so, so it's not incremental, your business. You should continue to say no. <laughs> However, sometimes with those crazy people that come your way, they saw value. And so what we want you to do is, is to take those assets, take that right away that you have, and use it to grow a new complementary business. But now it's a little bit like you're, on, you're the Hewlett and you're finding a new Packard to start the new business. That's a great comparison. Look at, uh, looking back to your P&G um, experience, how would you apply this idea um, to the business world? Uh, so I really, this book really has a target both very small entrepreneurs to help them be better entrepreneurs, but also really the power of a big company like Procter & Gamble or any of the very large companies is they have the ability to scale and for those of us who are taking venture financing, they have a cost of capital that is extremely admirable. Okay? <laughs> right. so, or desirable. Or desirable. And so, so what happens is, is they've often defined their businesses too narrowly. And so I talk about everybody is actually in three industries in order to try to open up your view of the world. And just to take a historic version of it, you have your core business, that's the product you sell. And so look at the railroad business, you know, which was a course important to Silicon Valley here but the railroad industry we talk about they missed their move to transportation they forgot They're, what industry they forgot they're in. what industry they're in they move things en masse from place to place even if it doesn't take rails the problem is it's every company loves their trains too much and so everything has to look like a train the real miss and where the reciprocity advantage was is in communication understanding that right away the literal land underneath their tracks, people could string wires above it. And then instead of Sally having to go from New York to Chicago twice a year to visit her sister, if you pay attention to the experience, she's communicating while she's there. That is the new business that you can build with your right of way. And now, reciprocity is a really ancient concept. And the problem of large, mature companies uh, finding ways to grow like fast, small companies is also quite a problem of long standing. So, why reciprocity now? What is it about the next 10 years that makes reciprocity a more powerful concept than the last 10 years? So, the social and technological changes have put us into a connected world where partners are going to be far more enabled than you ever imagined. And so supercomputing, 
available today if we all wanted to start a company with using Watson. Supercomputing is going to become ubiquitous. What that means is all kinds of people have immense capability to do things you never thought they would do. And that's the other thing that really um, I wondered about when I was reading your book. You talk about concepts like looking out for each other's interests, and that seems to be something that happens between individuals. So how can organizations bake reciprocity into their structures in a way that would survive key players leaving, like a CEO? The most important thing to a partnership if it's going to be challenging, because it's really nice to like your partners, but sometimes I joke we also have lawyers, <laughs> and, uh, and um, is, is to define what it is that I've always wanted to do, and I could only do it if we do it together. And if both of us answer that question, there's a very narrow piece that is the core that we hold on to in spite of everything else. And so if we go back to the communications example, okay, a, com a new communication startup and a railroad company are going to fight a lot. You know, this is not going to be a natural match. However, if they can recall the thing that they came to do, I have something you need, we're together in communications, I have these skills, I bring them to the game, you're bringing the technology, and you're going to understand this thing that goes a thousand times more frequent than my business, we're going to build a new business model together. If we can stay focused on this very, very narrow definition of why we came together, then we can pretty much ignore everything else. But if lawyers is part of the answer, then, the, then one of the questions I have is around these asymmetric partnerships that your book discusses, which is partnerships between very large companies like Fortune 500 entities. Or Apple. Yes, yes. Or and, Apple. And, and either very small companies Carl, like startups. you have to answer it quickly. Or even an individual. How does the little guy, what does the little guy have to look out for in an asymmetric partnership? When you form the partnership, it's no different than, I, than the venture capital world. You really want to define the reason for that partnership and you're going to want to get the right paperwork you know, together <laughs> so that we don't have to worry about that. But the real thing is, is you want to learn small together and then you only worry about scaling. Where you get the loss is if what you try to do is move so fast that before you've proven out where the real win is, you try to get too big before you've actually developed the partnership. Carl's book is The Reciprocity Advantage. We'll be back with press here in just a minute. Thank you.